Hello, everyone, and welcome. I hope everybody can hear us. Um, my name is Valdete Berisha, and I manage the microfinance gateway. As many of you know, the gateway is CGAP's global knowledge sharing platform for financial inclusion. And our webinar series um, is designed to enable practitioners and experts around the world uh, to share their lessons, tools, and, and research findings uh, with our global audience. Today, um, the topic of this webinar will be the future of microfinance. And our speakers, Ira Lieberman and Paul DiLeo, bring several decades of experience in microfinance. Um, Ira is currently um, the chairman and CEO of LIPAM International, an advisory firm that works with governments, international financial institutions, NGOs, and the private sector in developing and emerging economies. Um, he has held several board positions for major institutions that serve the microfinance sector. He also has taught on governance at the Boulder Microfinance Institute, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, for over 10 years, and has published extensively on several areas of microfinance and SMEs. Um, an interesting fact about Ira is that he also served as the CEO of CGAP between 1995 and 1999. So welcome, to, welcome back to CGAP, Ira. Um, Paul, on the other hand, is the founder and president of Grassroots Capital Management. He has over 20 years of experience in microfinance sector, and among other work, Paul has managed or advised funds that have invested equity in over 30 microfinance companies. I think uh, today we obviously have a lot of um, expertise that our speakers bring for this topic, and um, they will share with us key takeaways from a two-day workshop that was held last year at Lehigh University, uh, which gathered around uh, over 30 leaders from the global microfinance community. Um, so before we begin with the presentation, um, I just wanted to remind everyone that we have about 300 people that have registered for the webinar. Um, we expect around 100 to show up um, during the, the webinar. So uh, we will keep the participants' microphones muted so this will be an audio broadcast. However, you'll have the opportunity to submit your questions throughout the webinar using the chat box on the right-hand uh, side of the WebEx screen that you see in front of you. So if you just like to test that out um, and, and to get familiar with it, please do so. Um, but I encourage everyone to, to submit questions throughout the webinar. I will um, collect all of them and then ask um, ask them to to our speakers at the end of the uh, at the end of the presentation. So with that, I um, we will actually send the recording out um, very shortly after the webinar, within 24 hours or so. So uh, for those of you who um, would like to. We listen or forward it to our uh, to your colleagues. Please feel free to do so. Um, and with that, I am going to pass um, the presenter rights to our um, speakers. Great, thank you, Valente, uh, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, this is Paul, and uh, Ira and I will be sharing the, the presentation and uh, then uh, hopefully reserving a good bit of time, about 20 minutes or so, for, uh, for questions and discussion. So just very briefly, uh, what we're going to try to cover uh, succinctly is um, uh, how, uh, how this all uh, started and um, uh, how we gathered uh, the views that will be uh, presenting uh, and summarizing today. Um, what we covered uh, and what we've tried to compile and, and, uh, and make some sense out of is, is where microfinance has gotten to as of today uh, over its long gestation and development period, what some of the key factors in getting us here were, um, what we can take away from the microfinance experience, and then looking ahead, um, what the challenges facing microfinance are and um, what work uh, we uh, remains to be done 
uh, over the next uh, five or 10 years. So very briefly, as Valdete mentioned, um, uh, we helped organize together with the Martindale Center of uh, Lehigh University and with support from the Calmetto Foundation and the uh, Financial Inclusion Equity Council, um, a uh, workshop about a year ago um, uh, where we convened uh, a, quite a diverse group of um, of microfinance uh, practitioners, uh, uh, heads and senior managers of microfinance institutions, uh, investors, um, managers of investment funds and uh, uh, some uh, DFI uh, representatives, um, academics and analysts of the sector um, uh, to, to discuss uh, these issues. And the discussion was really prompted by uh, where we felt uh, the, the sector was at that time, which was sort of uh, existing in two alternative realities. On the one hand, there seemed to be a, an inclination to, uh, uh, among uh, some investors, uh, uh, public and private investors, that, that microfinance uh, was sort of done, that it had accomplished what it could, and it was time to move on to other, other sectors. On the other hand, what many of us were seeing on the ground was a very dynamic sector of institutions that uh, had, had uh, reached a very uh, substantial role in the national financial systems, were quite successful, were well integrated into capital markets, and were serving increasing numbers, hundreds of millions of, of clients. So, so we felt it was a good time to sort of step back and take stock of those, those two somewhat uh, inconsistent or contradictory views of the sector and try to reconcile them. Um, so, uh, uh, mm, this is stuck. Oh, sorry, just one moment. Um, so, the, um, the, the, the questions that we uh, tried to grapple with at the, at the workshop, um, as I mentioned, were what we've accomplished in the microfinance sector, where microfinance is now, whether it's sort of in decline or becoming less relevant um, and being uh, supplanted by, by new models, and uh, what are some of the major influences and forces um, shaping the sector uh, going forward. So I'll turn it to Ira now to, to, to just summarize where, where we've gotten to and where we are today. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to be with you today. Um, so I'll just talk briefly about the current state of microfinance since all of you or most of you are practitioners. You have your own uh, perceptions of where the industry or sector is. But uh, when CGAP started, virtually all microfinance institutions were NGOs or large cooperatives. Uh, and in fact, if people from the outside knew microfinance, they knew about Grameen, or insiders knew about big institutions like Grameen, uh, BRAC, Banco Sol, uh, uh, Bank Rekiat, Indonesia. And then most of the rest were relatively small, regionalized NGOs. Today, we've far exceeded any expectations. We had hoped we could reach 100 million clients, and now the suggestion is we're over 300 million. And in fact, with the IPOs recently in India, uh, th those numbers may increase substantially in the next few years. At the present moment, MFIs are a mix of formal institutions, commercialized uh, microfinance banks or commercial banks, downstreaming non-bank financial institutions, credit unions, cooperative, and still plenty of NGOs, but um, we're probably reaching as many as 300 clients around the world. The, the model has moved from donor dependence to being largely commercially viable, about 80% of microfinance institutions operate profitably, and they're able to raise money from capital markets, including the interbank market, uh, raising bonds, 
and as many as 12 IPOs over the recent years, uh, and also from uh, investment funds. As most of you know, a large investment fund industry has been created around microfinance. And above all, savings, which may be as important as loans, uh, the, the large commercial institutions also mobilize substantial savings. And as most of you know who've worked in Africa, there are more savings accounts in most MFIs than there are uh, loan accounts. Uh, the big challenge facing microfinance, in my view, in that respect, is commercializing and scaling up and also uh, maintaining the social focus and efforts by people at Axion, CGAP, other institutions to uh, make sure MFIs know their clients. The SMART campaign has been instrumental in making sure that we pay attention to the double bottom line, which remains critical if we're to be a viable social investment sphere. Um, amongst uh, impact investments, uh, about, amongst impact investors or impact investments, uh, microfinance remains the first and only globally scaled uh, double bottom line business model. And so at the Lehigh Workshop, uh, where there were people representing impact investment sector, one of the discussions was how they could learn from microfinance. Uh, you'll see that the, there's been a substantial uh, growth trajectory. I think microfinance at one point was growing on a compounded basis over 25% a year. Uh, now, since the crisis, that is down, but still is a very strong growth, growth base in almost all regions of the world. And for-profit regulated institutions have ca captured the bulk of the portfolio. In fact, if we look at the share of all borrowers and the share of all savers, large institutions that have been able to scale with over 100,000 clients have captured 38% of borrowers and some 48% of savers. And then the very large, with more than a million clients, have captured 48% of borrowers and 28% of savers. So together, they capture about 80% of the microfinance market, which is truly extraordinary uh, because they, they represent um, only 18% of all MFIs by number. Uh, if we look at performance, the, I think the most interesting fact is that by and large, the write-off ratio has hovered at 1% or less across uh, the world for microfinance. Uh, the return on equity is positive, more positive in some regions than others, and um, the growth in borrowers continues at a very substantial rate um, in the range of 20% for most regions uh, except East Asia and the Pacific. Finally, uh, this is 209 data. Uh, we'll need to update this data, but you can see how important savings are for very large institutions. I'll pass to Paul. Thanks, Ira. So um, uh, one of the interesting um, uh, questions was, uh, you know, looking back over what has been a very extended period of of development uh, of of uh, microfinance, um, looking back and trying to sort of take stock of of how how we got where we are today and how we we achieved the accomplishments that that Ira just uh, summarized. And um, what what uh, we uh, concluded was that there were sort of three phases of the development of microfinance, and um, we thought it was uh, uh, interesting to to identify these and what some of the key key factors in the different phases were, uh, because we think these the, these phases may also have some relevance or apply more or less uh, uh, directly to the development of other uh, impact sectors or double bottom line business models. 
Um, and um, in particular, we thought it was interesting to sort of see how the role of grants and concessional financing evolved uh, during these different phases. The first phase was really, and we're talking about now back uh, 30 years ago, um, uh, was really developing the model. Um, there was a lot, as, as some of you may recall, a lot of experimentation, a lot of trial and error. Uh, different uh, different models were were uh, funded by various uh, philanthropies and and uh, uh, official institutions, official funding sources. But what this really led to was the emergence of some. Uh, very solid business models that could then be assembled into uh, various types of, of corporate structures as, as Ira has, has summarized. Um, and increasingly um, over time, those corporate structures included uh, for-profit uh, entities. Um, as these models stabilized and as uh, institutional vehicles uh, emerged, for delivering these products, um, a, uh, a very deliberate effort was undertaken to develop uh, an infrastructure and an ecosystem that would support oh. the development. Sorry, Paul. I I don't know. Did somebody just kicked us out of this? I'm sorry. We need to call back in. We're on. We're on. Yeah. Okay. Um, Apologies. Can everybody hear us? I'm. Uh, if you can't hear us, just type in in the chat box, please. We can hear you. Okay. Okay. Great. great. Sure. Sorry about Thank that. You. Sorry for the uh, interruption. Um, so, uh, so uh, picking back up during the second phase, uh, there was an effort to to develop a, a supporting uh, infrastructure, and this comprised uh, a quite a few different uh, components. There was, as some of you may remember, uh, the microbanking bulletin of, of years ago, which uh, began to compile uh, data and develop uh, peer group benchmarking. There was the, the Boulder Institute that uh, Ira uh, uh, participated in to, uh, to develop uh, human resources. There was an effort uh, led by CGAP and, and, and others to support the development in different countries of appropriate supervisory frameworks, and, and on and on, as, as, as many of you may, um, may recall or have participated in. But this all was an essential part of enabling uh, what was now a reliable and viable business model to really coalesce into an industry, a distinct industry that could present a coherent profile to the outside world and in particular to the capital markets. And uh, needless to say, most of the efforts to develop this infrastructure and ecosystem were again funded by concessional funding or grant funding. The third phase then, uh, sorry, trying to advance the slide. Not working. Uh, okay, sorry. Um, the third phase then was based on uh, based on this um, uh, this uh, uh, these these uh, viable business models and with the support of this infrastructure and data and um, 
uh, 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 professional uh, management. Um, the, uh, the industry was then in a position to approach the mainstream capital markets to uh, engage the resources necessary, the financial resources necessary to begin to scale and to achieve uh, the levels of, of outreach and, and market penetration in uh, the different countries around the world that, that we see today. So this, this again, uh, took several forms. Um, there were uh, many vehicles created starting, I would say, really uh, in the, uh, around 2000 uh, and, and going forward. Uh, from there, um, many vehicles created, uh, many of which relied initially at least on a tranche of first loss uh, capital that again was provided by um, grants or, or various concessionary funding. There was the emergence of a whole um, uh, a group of uh, managers dedicated, specialized managers dedicated to investing uh, debt and equity into microfinance institutions. Um, and they um, uh, created what's now, uh, at this point, more than 100 uh, specialized microfinance investment vehicles. Um, and then there's an ongoing process of, of investor education, which has been um, taken up now by, by industry um, bodies like, like the GIN uh, in uh, more, more uh, general impact investing and, and specialized bodies like the Financial Institutions Equity Council and, and others that, that try to educate investors about the microfinance investment opportunity. Should I have uh, Yeah. Let me do that. There, I think I got it. Um, so um, just to highlight a few of the factors that um, uh, were uh, a key in, in this path, um, again, was, was these sort of stages of developing the business model, uh, creating the industry and building the, the infrastructure around the industry and giving it a distinct identity and, and profile. Um, and then uh, approaching in a very deliberate and, uh, and careful way the capital markets to enable uh, the sector to scale. And, and uh, you know, we feel that most likely these are stages that, that any impact sector or indeed probably any, any, any new business sector will have to uh, pursue, um, although uh, uh, hopefully the time required to traverse these various phases can be shortened um, for some of the, the newer uh, sectors. So um, what are the key takeaways then from these three phases of development for microfinance? One is that microfinance has succeeded all growth expectations. It's now uh, a fully recognized uh, financial sector. Um, it provides a range of pro poor financial products and services, and um, we can say it's gone mainstream. And it provides access to hundreds of millions of families, including, I would repeat, savings, which in many cases are as important or sometimes more important than loans. The second takeaway is Traditional microfinance is a proven model, but it faces persistent challenges from new competitors and especially disruptive technologies, which we'll talk about more in a second. So microfinance will require some continuous patient capital from donors and uh, foundations uh, in order to, to move on to a next phase, which incorporates these disruptive technologies and to meet the challenges that it currently faces. Third, um, as the line between microfinance and fully commercial financial services blur, a key caution moving forward is in maintaining adequate focus on the social agenda and people in the industry have made a point of social ratings, know your clients, 
making sure boards of directors pay attention to social impact. And uh, this will continue to be very important if microfinance is to be credible as a social investment field. Uh, the fourth key takeaway uh, is that micro MFIs remain a unique and vital resource uh, to their clients and to the industry and to, to investors with an extended trust relationship with poor clients and communities, and they have a unique potential to advance many of the SDGs or Sustainable Development uh, Goals, and, and that should be a key target going forward for the future. I'll pass on to Paul to discuss the challenges ahead. So yeah, we're just going to take uh, uh, take take a look now at some of the key uh, challenges uh, that were identified going forward. Um, but we'd like to actually pause and take a moment uh, for you to um, indicate what you feel uh, based on on your vantage point. Uh, the key challenges are, and then we'll sort of see how how well that coincides with what uh, emerged from the discussion that we had um, uh, last year. So we'll just take a moment to let you um, participate in this poll. Um, I think it's fairly straightforward how to do it. You just click, click on a box. So click on a box and we can compile the results and um, hopefully there will be some, some overlap and coincidence Okay, well, while, um, while you're doing that, it should be fairly quick. Um, I'll just uh, take a moment to, uh, to uh, summarize what, uh, what our gathering identified as, as the key challenges ahead. Um, the first was um, the, um, the need for microfinance institutions to really be able to introduce uh, products uh, other than credit at scale. And um, uh, while Iris mentioned the success that many institutions have had in mobilizing savings, the ability of institutions to find ways of delivering other products, financial products, that in many cases uh, are seen as at least as um, uh, relevant and uh, 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 Offering potential to uh, to improve the circumstances of clients, at, at least as relevant as as credit, and these are things like um, uh, various types of insurance and uh, money transfer services. Um, so we've we've seen those introduced. Um, the, the 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 scale uh, that they've achieved in many cases has been um, modest. And so uh, one challenge is um, finding ways to, to achieve scale with these products um, and, uh, and uh, make them commercially viable uh, for, for the microfinance institutions. Um, a second uh, challenge uh, that Ira alluded to was um, how to uh, incorporate uh, the various uh, types of digital financial services that, that are, are rapidly um, uh, being introduced uh, around the world, how to incorporate these in a constructive way uh, into the microfinance institutions. And, you know, it's important, I think, um, and, and uh, increasingly, you know, microfinance institutions are sort of taking a more disaggregated look at at what comprises the digital financial services and looking at um, uh, obviously mobile money and, and, and payments, but also at uh, um, uh, compiling uh, large uh, databases on their clients and client behavior and, and, and client needs and trying to use that to both develop products and to do in some cases scoring and to try to uh, automate 
what aspects of the client relationship and, and the, the back office operations can be automated and made more efficient while preserving the, uh, the front office relationship with clients. Um, uh, many of the, um, uh, much of the discussion that we had highlighted that uh, if microfinance has a comparative advantage um, over other financial institutions, it is its knowledge of and relationship with, with its clients and the sort of bottom-up um, information that it has on client needs and client behaviors. And so finding ways of incorporating the efficiencies that are uh, available from uh, various types of digital financial services, but combining that uh, with um, ways of retaining the client relationship um, is, um, is, is the challenge. Um, the third uh, challenge is Given the, the reach and the uh, infrastructure that microfinance represents in terms of its penetration into poor communities and its relationship with so many uh, poor families around the world, how can that infrastructure be utilized to deliver other types of services or facilitate the delivery of other types of services, perhaps by, by partners or third parties that can have a uh, uh, enhance the the impact of the of the relationship, and then finally, um, the, uh, the, the the there's an ongoing uh, need to improve uh, and strengthen the governance of the institutions. Ira mentioned the importance of the governance function in preserving the the balanced uh, double bottom line character of these institutions. But you know, we've also seen over the years. Um, many um, uh, problems uh, in specific institutions, some failures, and in, in many cases, um, these uh, problems and failures can be traced back to weakness in uh, the governance of the institution. So continuing to improve governance um, remains uh, a, a challenge as well. So just to, just to check in with the poll, um, it seems that uh, the, uh, the digital finance challenge is the clear, um, clear uh, uh, choice of, um, of, uh, of most of most of you. Uh, and um, again, I just say that as we've talked about this, not just at the, the gathering a year ago, but in, in subsequent uh, meetings since then. Um, you know, what, what we've sort of realized and, and found is that uh, really digging down into exactly which aspect of digital financial services we're talking about makes the, the, the discussion uh, richer and, and more, more relevant um, as, uh, as we get to sort of an implementation uh, phase. Um, so, uh, So, uh, and then finally, just um, just uh, referring back to to uh, the initial discussion of phases, um, uh, the, the the sort of grant and concessional funding uh, role uh, has changed during these different phases, but but continues to be uh, important and to play an important role in microfinance and in preserving and enhancing the distinct character of microfinance, and that'll continue to be the case going forward. And in particular, um, it seems that uh, as we continue to see a need to innovate, uh, find new ways of reaching clients who continue to pose a challenge, um, that this type of concessional funding um, will continue to be essential uh, if that kind of innovation and outreach is going to is going to continue. And um, finally, uh, just a, a sort of a cautionary note for for impact investing more generally is that. Um, we have to be uh, modest in our demands and expectations uh, uh, of, of these um, uh, impact sectors 
as, as investments, that, uh, you know, these are uh, ultimately double bottom line institutions, which means that um, we need to give uh, adequate weight to both sides of the investment proposition. And if we become too heavily weighted on either side, we're likely to throw, throw things off balance. So we can't always uh, get everything we want out of these investments and we need to control our, our appetites. Um, so I think uh, Ira can now wrap yeah. us up. Yeah, so I'll be very brief because we really want to leave time for questions. And um, what are the conclusions then from this talk and from the workshop we had uh, with 30 odd participants from around the world at Lehigh University uh, last year? First, and you have mentioned this in your survey, uh, the ability to integrate the high-tech models of not only digital finance, but we haven't mentioned fintech, which is sort of uh, related to digital finance, but not necessarily completely overlapping. So we need to be able to incorporate the high-tech client relationships of microfinance with the, the high-touch relationships of microfinance with the high-tech of digital finance and fintech. Second, we need to use the infrastructure in place and the market knowledge and relationship with clients to extend to other products, uh, both financial products and hopefully uh, services such as healthcare, education, housing, and uh, other related impact areas, and in rural areas, agricultural extension, solar energy, uh, water for irrigation, water for human consumption. So there's a range of potential products that uh, microfinance can move out to, uh, hopefully assessing the risk. A third area is to uh, articulate the impact of the new business models uh, and to understand who it will affect, how, what services uh, will benefit them, and how to measure the impact of these extended and diverse services. Uh, finally, we need to cultivate investors. A lot of the microfinance funds have moved and are now calling themselves uh, impact investment funds or social investment funds more broadly. And microfinance needs to continue to sell its case uh, to the investment world. And, and I would also include the donor world who have felt that the job is done. I don't feel the job is done. Paul doesn't feel the job is done. CGAP certainly doesn't think the job is done. And the job is to convince uh, the donor world that uh, it's necessary to continue to provide a certain amount of soft money or targeted subsidies uh, to incorporate technology and other innovations. Um, and finally, to conclude, uh, it's to hardwire the mission, make sure that the, the new developments are incorporated within the corporate culture and structure of MFIs to preserve their social function as well as their financial performance. And I will mention one last thing. We have an appendix uh, in the, in the, as the last slide into the paper uh, you will have received or have received, uh, and th that appendix has four blogs uh, that came out of the conference, but it also has um, five different videos of an hour each representing the panel discussions that had what happened in the workshop. So if you want to explore this talk in more depth, please go to the appendix and reach out to the URLs for the videos or the blogs. Thank you very much for your attention. I guess we'll move on to questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ira and Paul. And we've had a really uh, engaged audience. There's many, many comments um, and then questions that just uh, keep pouring in this last minute. So I'm going to start with a couple of very early questions. Um, that one came from Tim Nippel. 
um, and it's um, about the digital delivery channels um, and how much of the discussion about MFIs um, surrounds that topic. But um, he's, Tim is also asking um, about the importance of digital transformation of internal systems uh, within MFIs to keep um, to keep uh, MFIs uh, that gives a, gives an advantage to MFIs in terms of managing client relationships. Want me to go to the internal and then you? So I'll answer on the internal. Um, that's where fintech comes in as very important uh, because uh, Paul and I were part of a team that, that examined U.S. microfinance to the U.S. Treasury, and as part of that, we looked at the fintech sector. And in the United States, one fintech company uh, had done more lending in five years than the entire U.S. microfinance industry. Now, I would not say the U.S. industry is as robust as international microfinance, but fintechs can be very efficient in underwriting loans. So to the extent microfinance institutions that have reached scale can develop proprietary underwriting models, uh, that should enhance efficiency and lower costs and um, increase the knowledge of, of your, you, your client, your knowledge of your client base. So I believe the internal aspects of digital finance and fintech uh, is very important. Uh, maybe Paul wants to comment on uh, other channels uh, of. Yeah, well, I would just I would just add that you know I think that um, you know some of the initial experience that I'm familiar with is you know there's there's different aspects of digital finance or fintech you know some are easier to to accommodate and to integrate into the you know microfinance business models that are already out there than than others you know both the technically and and culturally, um, you know, so I think, um, you know, in terms of, you know, mobile mobile payments on, on the one, one end, you know, maybe the easiest to, to, to integrate without, you know, fundamentally rearranging the business model. And then when you get into, um, you know, collecting data, building databases, um, you know, there are obvious efficiencies that can be gained there. Um, but, uh, you know, the challenge is, you know, as you free up the time of the frontline staff, the front front office staff that's directly relating with customers, um, how can you redeploy those resources to higher value um, engagement with clients rather than just sort of undermining them? Um, so I think that's the, the challenge that that some institutions are, are grappling with, but you know, increasingly uh, grappling with uh, successfully, so that they don't cannibalize their existing um, business model. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, the next question, I'm going to read some of the questions that came early on, and then move into the the second set. The next question is from Max Nino, um, and it's for Paul. What is your view of how impact data can be used in the microfinance sector to attract more impact investors? And who is leading this work? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think uh, what, uh, you know, there's a few, I, I can just say what our experience is, you know, as, as an investment manager, um, you know, we uh, sort of are, are using a variety of different um, uh, channels or frameworks to try to document and, and communicate impact. And they range from, on the one hand, there's a sort of a generic impact rating system called uh, GEARS, the Global Impact Investment Rating System, uh, which cuts across sectors. And so we use that as sort of a very, you know, as, as kind of a first cut to sort of try to demonstrate the impact orientation and the double bottom line character of the business. And then there are more microfinance specific um, frameworks uh, like the uh, SPI-4, Social Performance uh, SPI, I don't remember what the I stands for, but um, uh, which is very specifically focused on um, 
uh, microfinance. And, and likewise, you have the smart campaign and the client protection principles and the, the ratings that some institutions are generating out of, out of that rating system. And then, uh, you know, but, but you also have, given the sort of multiplicity of, of impact-oriented products and services, you know, you do uh, have to really uh, include uh, in, institution-specific information in terms of institutions that may have uh, a program related to women's health or may have a program related to primary education. And these, th these are very challenging to aggregate across institutions because they tend to be so uh, specific to particular communities being served by that institution and particular models. It's very difficult to come up with aggregate data, but I think, you know, providing investors with some information about the types of, of initiatives that institutions are taking that are particularly relevant to their client base and their communities is also helpful to, to, to engage investors. Great, thank you. Actually, uh, sort of a related question comes from Barbara Magnoni, um, and it's for you, Paul, um, and it says, I would like Paul's view on the type of investors that may be entering and potentially distorting expectations, weighing too heavily on the financial return side of the equilibrium, um, they have more money than any donor, and how can the industry work with these funds to help balance their impact and avoid distortions? Yeah, well, you know, it's it's uh, you know it's kind of a, a be careful what you wish for uh, situation because on the one hand, you know, we've all been working uh, very diligently for you know whatever twenty years or more to try to engage exactly these types of investors because they're the ones with the with the, the, the amounts of money required to, to capitalize um, institutions at sufficient scale to really, uh, you know, be, be appropriate to the scale of the, of the challenge. Um, so, so on the one hand, you know, we should celebrate our success in being taken seriously by these investors and, and attracting this capital. You know, on the other hand, you know, as you say, uh, Barbara, you know, there is a risk of, of distorting uh, the the institutions and and really undermining the double bottom line character of the institutions, you know, for for us we sort of see this as a particular responsibility of equity investors, and you know when we talk about hardwiring and in institutions and when we talk about you know the importance of governance, this is an important part of what we're of what we're talking about is ensuring that at the level of equity. Um, you have an alignment among shareholders uh, in support of the, 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 the essential character of the institution. And, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, a number of cases where this is working quite well, that the more commercial investors that come into the institutions appreciate, um, just from a commercial standpoint, the sort of stability of the returns, you know, maybe some uh, lower correlation than they may have uh, compared to other assets in their portfolios, but are able to understand that these financially attractive features really are based on the social commitment of the institution. You know, in other cases, though, you've seen investors that come in and really fundamentally alter the character of the institution. So it's really, I think, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about responsible exit, and, um, you know, that's, that's obviously important for us to scrutinize who we're selling assets to. But I think it's also important that we take the time well before exit to, to incorporate into the institution, and this is what we refer to as hardwiring, you know, features that make very clear what the character of the institution is and, and, and in a sense sort of uh, impose some obstacles to fundamentally altering the character of the institution. Thank you. Um, so I guess a re somewhat related question is has to do with customer protection. And one um, question or comment that comes from uh, Getane Gobezi um, is asking if you have any insights in terms of uh, any negative impacts, um, including on gender relations or uh, within the household or over indebtedness. Etc. 
I guess this has to do with um, impact, negative impacts of MFIs or... Um, no, I'll, I'll, I'll tackle it, sure. Uh, this is a very uh, interesting and delicate question. Uh, I think there's no question that certain markets, um, you, you can put it one of two ways, uh, over lending or over borrowing has occurred and markets have reached saturation much uh, more quickly than we would have anticipated in microfinance. Uh, and I think Rich Rosenberg and colleagues, and Rich was at CGAP for a long time, and he wrote a great deal about the, the industry, but Rich looked very um, aggressively or very um, in-depth at the issue of overborrowing and saturation. So I think you could probably still find this work on the gateway. Um, but we we look at certain markets, for example, in um, Eastern Europe or former Soviet Union, uh, for example, like Kosovo, or you, you look at certain um, other markets, even Bangladesh, where you have uh, four or five major institutions competing with each other in villages. And without rating agencies and without good data, the danger is that people borrow from several institutions. Each of the institutions don't know about the other's loans, and people can become highly indebted. And I'm not sure without, um, uh, without good rating agencies and good controls how you can prevent that. But it's definitely been a feature that the industry should be concerned about, and there's no doubt that in, in a certain number of markets uh, that has occurred. Thank you, Ira. So I'm going to uh, read another question um, that takes us back to um, capital, and it's, it's coming from Robert Ongodia. Um, and it's, um, it says, it seems the growth of capital towards this sector is slowing down because there is too much money chasing too few assets in the market. New institutions are not popping up because the elements, such as grants for startups collaboration, that built early success institutions have or are disappearing. Uh, what could be a solution to this? Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, as as you um, uh, uh, highlight, uh, Robert, I think there's uh, there's a question of sort of overall uh, supply of capital to the industry and uh, distinguishing the different types of capital that are uh, flowing to the industry. And you know, overall, I think the um, you know the flow of capital into the industry is 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 probably you know pretty pretty uh, ample, um, but the composition of that capital, as as you know, I think Barbara's question and, and your question now are, are 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 highlighting. You know the composition of that capital has has shifted so that there's much more capital being driven by more uh, commercial considerations. Unless that comes with a, with an explicit or, or priority on uh, social or or uh, innovations um, focused on 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 uh, uh, impact, so um, you know I think a part of part of frankly the uh, the the uh, consideration of of this gathering and this discussion, uh, you know, as I think Ira has mentioned. Um, is trying to uh, impress on the suppliers of social capital, you know, be they philanthropies or official institutions or, or other types of donors, that there's a continuing need for this type of very uh, clearly uh, socially oriented uh, capital. There's a continuing need for this capital in the industry, even though it has achieved so much success. And, and so much access to commercial capital, that if that capital disappears, you know, two things happen. Uh, one is that the types of innovation uh, and experimentation that are required to uh, continuously enhance the social impact 
uh, of microfinance institutions uh, diminishes or disappears, that that, that innovation uh, will not occur. And secondly, the sort of balance uh, that is uh, essential at the level of governance uh, also uh, disappears. And you have institutions uh, entirely or, or, or uh, overwhelmingly dominated by commercial considerations. So, you know, maintaining an important flow of, a significant flow of uh, capital which is prioritizing the social side of the microfinance investment proposition is a really critical challenge for, for the industry if it's going to maintain its, uh, its character. Thank you. Well, so I guess there's many, many questions and we're not going to be able to go all over all of them. Um, so maybe these will be the last two questions, and one of them has to do with gender because there, there were several comments and questions uh, about it. You mentioned governance to be one of the uh, challenges for MFIs, and um, one participant is asking whether you can comment on um, gender in uh, governance as an, as an issue uh, of women's underrepresentation in governance. Sure. Um, this is Ira. Um, you know, I've, I've been on the board and I'm currently on the board of um, a couple of, a, a large network of microfinance institutions in Africa. And my experience is that uh, boards have been very mixed uh, gender-wise and, uh, and um, also in terms of the role of the chair, board chairs. Uh, so I've not seen that as an acute problem. Uh, I should say I can compare and contrast that to my experience on corporate boards. I had many years in private industry and I've served on uh, corporate boards, particularly in recent years in the biotech field where I was the chair of, of a large publicly listed biotech company. And there we were always striving for gender diversity because we, we never had enough. And so I actually think microfinance has done reasonably well in, in that area. I'll pass the ball and see what he thinks. He's also served on the board of a variety of microfinance institutions. Yeah, you know, I think there's, uh, you know, and there's been some, some research, I'm, I'm trying to remember, there was a, a, a paper done looking specifically at Latin American microfinance institutions and the representation of of women uh, at, at different levels uh, in terms of, of staff and management and, and uh, boards um, in, uh, among those institutions. Um, and we can try to find that, that link. Um, but, you know, I think there's clearly uh, overall, my, my impression is there's a mismatch between, you know, the proportion of the clients who are uh, women and the proportion of of uh, you know loan officers and senior managers and and directors, so I think you know there there is um, you know uh, an ongoing need for this to be a uh, sort of a deliberate process of ensuring that that boards are taking uh, responsibility for for uh, ensuring uh, a meaningful representation of and, and it's not just a, a, a feature of, of, of women. I mean, I think that the, the composition of, of boards is something that uh, we need to pay close attention to, both from the standpoint of the types of expertise that we engage uh, to be adequate right. to addressing the challenges going forward. But also, you know, clearly gender is, a, is an important part um, to, to ensure that, that 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 perspective uh, is is adequately represented in terms of product development and delivery. Great. Okay. Well, some progress has made uh, has been made, but obviously there's a, a long way to go. It seems so. I I think we have to close here because it's um, it's almost one minute away from ten um, Eastern time in Washington D.C. So. I would like to thank you again, both uh, Ira and Paul, for a great thought-provoking webinar and to everyone for joining today.
Um, I'm sorry we couldn't answer all the questions, but this webinar was had a very engaged audience, so we will send out the webinar recording and related material. In the meantime, I we usually um, do a poll at the end of the webinar just to ask everybody what um, they thought to let us uh, know their feedback about the webinar. So I'd appreciate if you can take just a couple of minutes to respond to the questions that are appearing now on the screen. Um, and then uh, we will, as I said, we will email, send an email to everyone who registered uh, with a link to our website page, that which will have the recording, the PowerPoint presentation, um, the links to the paper that is um, uh, that, that the webinar was based on, as well as all of the uh, blog posts that, that um, uh, Ira mentioned during the, the presentation. So um, we, we will do that in, in the next couple of days. The one thing that, another thing that I actually wanted to ask, if you are interested to join, um, next week we are hosting another webinar that focuses on uh, capacity building for um, within the financial inclusion sector. And the webinar features um, CGAP's Gateway Academy, uh, which is an online learning platform. Um, it also, uh, the speakers also are from the Kenya Commercial Bank and FSD. Um, so I encourage you to re uh, register for this webinar. You can, uh, we'll post the event link on the chat box shortly so that you can go directly and, and register. Um, and with that, I um, thank our speakers one more time for, for their time and an interesting presentation. And um, we'll look forward to seeing everybody back to our future webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Very well done.